I'd like to use for a sermonic theme this morning, you are not off the hook. You are not off the hook. As it relates to America and racism, there is an age-old question of are we responsible for what our ancestors have done? Some could say it's a good question. Some could say there's a better question. But nonetheless, it is a question. For many, absolutely not. For many, they are not responsible for their ancestors or what their ancestors did or the fact that their ancestors enslaved a whole group of people. For some, I'm sorry it happened, but it's not on my watch. And yet there are others that answer this question, yes. Yes, it is the responsibility. If you have benefited from the privilege of your skin, if you've had privileges that have come to you for the color of your skin, if you can embrace all the benefits that come to you given by the color of your skin, then yes, you can also embrace the responsibility as well. For sure, there are no quick or easy answers. Almost as soon as slavery was over, believe it or not, the idea of reparations was introduced. It's not something new. It actually started way back in the eight, late 1800s. There's all kinds of research on the harm of slavery. Talk about an unequal race. Slavery set African Americans back, and we can still, to this day, see the effects in every field, in jobs, in housing, in health, in education, in every field. This month's series, I've been talking about building bridges. I compare building bridges to biking uphill. How many of you had a bike when you were a kid? Maybe you still do have a bike. When you're going downhill on a bike, it's fun, right? You can let your feet off the wheels. You can cruise. It is easy going downhill, unless you get a little scared. But then when you start biking up that hill, you really got to put a lot into it to get up the hill. Sometimes you even have to get, up, get off the bike and just walk the bike up the hill. It takes a lot of effort going uphill. I compare that to building bridges. Building bridges takes real effort. One of the ways that we try to build bridges is by hearing people, which is different from listening. You see, listening to people is when you can tell people exactly what they said back to them. But when we hear people, we take the message of what folks are saying to us. Prayer is a part of it, but not as an ending point, which often Christians fall on. I'm going to pray about that. I'm going to pray for you. I'm impressed right now with Evanston, who has done real work around reparations. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but they are using the profits of their cannabis sales to help blacks in the, in the area of housing. They're helping them with housing repairs and down payment assistance. They're doing that for anybody who experienced housing discrimination from 1919 to 1969. It's not everything, but it's a beginning. And it's a bridge. This is where we enter the biblical text this morning. Elijah was a successful employee of God. He got his assignments and did as he was told. Here is a man who has given his life totally in faithfulness to Yahweh. He not only works for God, but he works, he works overtime. It wasn't always what people wanted to hear, but, you know, oh well. And he was doing good for a while, but then let's just say some people were not happy with him. Rumor has it a hit had been put out on his life. You heard correctly, threats are issued to take this guy out. They weren't playing back then. You think they're not playing now? They were not playing in the Old Testament at all. Elijah is like, you ain't got to tell me twice. I'm out of here. Straight out of Beersheba, he heads to the wilderness, to the desert. His mood is one of absolute defeat and desolation. After all he had done for God, his successful employment now seemed hollow. You ever feel like that? Like you're doing good and like for what? While speaking truth builds bridges, it also earns you enemies. He's depressed. He feels like God has not protected him. 
and he wants to die. You heard Peter and acted out. Great acting, by the way, Peter. Have you ever had someone issue a death threat to you? How many of you have had someone issue a death threat? Come on, keep it real. Raise your hand. Not a one of you. Amazing. Or have you ever wanted to die because life had gotten just that bad? Maybe not, but you probably have tasted fear. Fear has been creeping up a lot in the text this month. There's a lot of fear going on. There's a lot of fear going around. A colleague of mine that got the same lectionary text as I did today for his sermon preparation put out, what are you afraid of? And so I sneaked on his page and there were 35 responses. I'm going to read a few of them to you now. I'm afraid for the future of my kids, my grandkids, and my great-grandkids. I'm afraid that my children will be hurt. I'm afraid of Alzheimer. I'm afraid of losing control of myself. Listen to this one. I'm afraid of my church council. <laughs> I'm afraid that I will die alone, forgotten, and old, and that the only one who will care is the overworked nurse who needs the bed for the next poor side. I'm afraid that our country is being destroyed. <clears throat> I fear that our country is broken and it cannot be fixed. I fear the misinformation that's being given out. I fear that I will not be forgiven for all my bad choices. I fear that my heart has become so hard. I fear that I will not be good enough to make it into heaven. I fear that I'm going to make it in, but my loved ones won't, <laughs> and we'll be separated forever. <laughs> One person put, after losing a child, I fear nothing. Another person, I fear my own mortality. I fear failure in starting all over again. What are your fears? Did some of those hit a nerve? Were they something that you could resonate with? Yesterday, a colleague of mine got to go to a live concert outside. And she said in the middle of the concert, she found herself scanning the crowd for some crazy person with an AR-15, not allowing her to really enjoy the concert. How did we get here? What are your fears? Elijah was really scared, and that fear, that fear drove him out of his mind. There's this funny skit of a black man running by Burger King, and as the folks see him, they don't ask questions, they all start running too. The point is, if you see a black man running, you should run too, because nothing good is coming. And Elijah, Elijah took off. At this point, he isn't even driving fear, but fear is driving him. He sits under a tree and life is so bad from his perspective. Are you getting this? That he says, God, take my life. Just take it. I don't want it. I don't want what's coming to me. I don't care. Just get this over with. Take me out. And then he does the next best thing. Have you ever been so stressed you just go to sleep? He lay down and he went to sleep. I can't overstate how scared Elijah was. Our fear doesn't even begin to compare to what this follower of God was feeling. It's not easy to stand up to bullies. Josiah and I, we finally finished Will's memoir, and he picked Kevin Hart. Now, if you listen to Kevin Hart's memoir, don't hold me accountable for anything that comes out of Kevin Hart's mouth. But in it, and this is Father Day. He shares about his own father. Will shared about his father. Kevin shares about his father. Now, this was some dude. Like his dad put a bull on him and his brother because he lost the game. He dropped Kevin off at the wrong school for camp. He stole his brother's equipment from his new business. I mean, everything out the barbershop, the stools, everything. And you know, 
they never stood up to their dad because they said our dad was crazy and he would have killed us. He was a bully. Elijah knew there was a death threat and he knew who issued it and he knew it was dead serious and he sank to that low place. And God did not, for as much as Elijah was going through, God did not let Elijah off the hook. You would think God would cut Elijah a little bit of slack. Nope. At Elijah's lowest, God does not let him off the hook. He gives him more work to do. What will define Elijah? His fear of others or his faithfulness to God? What will define you? Your fear of what's out there or your faithfulness to God. Will Smith at 50 decided to confront his fear by jumping out of a plane. Some naysayers would say it don't take all that, but it did for him. We're all on this journey. Fear was talking to Elijah in one ear, but God was talking in both ears. Elijah, you ain't off the hook. Eat, replenish yourself, get ready, prepare for the journey because you have work to do and I am not letting you off the hook. At the YMCA, they have a very specific way they teach people how to swim. Teaching people how to swim is all about, it's all about first confronting fear because often the reason that folks can't swim in the first place is what? Fear. And so at the Y here on 63rd and Stony Island, only the swimmers are allowed in the pool area. When parents drop their kids off, parents, you can't stay in there. They know what parents are going to do. You can watch on the other side, but the only people that are allowed in this area are the people that are addressing, learning how to swim. If you've ever watched a class on swimming, what you will see is fear. I told you guys that one day the guy was just battling the water and the teacher was like, stand up. And he was just like drowning in four feet of water. And the teacher was like, stand up. There will always be some kid that's crying or some adult explaining why they can't do what the teacher is asking them to do. And at every turn, these teachers, they are taught, they've been trained how to handle fear. They do not speak to the fear. They speak to what they know. If you do as I say, you will learn how to swim. And so God does not speak to Elijah's fear. He really doesn't even address it. No empathy at all. He is not willing to let Elijah off the hook. In fact, our God is just not that kind of God. God is not about to give up on Elijah, and God is not about to give up on us. God shows Elijah who he is. God sends the wind, but the text says he's not in the wind, and God sends the tornado, and he's not there, and God sends the earthquake and the fire. And finally, Elijah is able to hear God. May we, in our time of uncertainty, hear God too. We are not off the hook Christians. Eat, rest, wander in the wilderness, reflect, pray. But we are not off the hook. We have a lot of bridges to build. On the Dan Ryan downtown, at least five years ago, they started this project between 94 and 290. Have you ever driven by? Five years ago. They are still working on this project. Ask me how I know, because I've driven through it to get to school. It takes years to build, but we are followers of Christ until we expire. So we've got nothing better to do but time. So I am inviting you to think of one thing you can do that builds bridges. One thing, and then when you've done that one thing, do one more thing. One thing to build peace. One thing to build bridges. One thing. I am reading How Not to Be Afraid by Gareth Higgins, and I have to tell you this funny story. I um, went to the dentist, you know, 
during COVID, I didn't quite make it to the dentist. And so you know what happens when you don't get those regular cleanings. And so I was having some concern and I had this book in my hand, How Not to Be Afraid, which is totally, I'm gonna tell you in a minute what it's about. But the assistant in the office, finally at some point I was trying to get clarity about my teeth cleaning and what kind of remedies I could get because I knew this was gonna be an intense cleaning. And she looks at the book and she says, wow, that's a good book for you. <laughs> so Gareth grew up in Northern Ireland with a lot of turmoil and hort and pain and division. And he grew up fearful. Over 4,000 people died in that division. And what he shares in this book is we don't have to participate in the dominant narrative of life that what is broken cannot be fixed. He began working with a group made of us and them, working on peacemaking in Northern Ireland, and they were able to make a difference. They came together to begin to repair a torn apart country. He believes in his book that what applies in this book really can be a tool for all of us. They stopped participating in the dominant narrative and they began another narrative of hope and peace we can watch the news and we can talk, but we too have another narrative of being the church on the corner, of being a neighbor. We have another narrative in the Bible. Neighbors are present, neighbors observe, and they participate in the life of the community. We need all of you to participate in this narrative of who United Church of Hyde Park could really be. So what will define us? Will it be our fear or will it be our faith? Every Sunday at the benediction, we send you into the world, but we don't just send you to go home and eat and take a nap and watch TV. We send you out there to build bridges. We send you out there to live your faith. We are not off the hook, people of God, for living a life of faithfulness. We are not off the hook for how we live our lives Monday through Saturday. We are not off the hook for standing up to bullies. We are not off the hook for addressing racism, one of the biggest sin in our country. We are not off the hook. We are not off the hook. We are not off the hook for speaking truth to power, even if there are threats issued on our life. We are not off the hook. We are not off the hook for being a part of the solution. We are not off the hook. Happy Juneteenth. Amen. <laughs>